Okay, let's get started this afternoon. Welcome back. Let's get a blue hymn book. Go to number 277 in the blue hymn book. 277. Number 277. O thou in whose presence my soul takes delight, on whom in affliction I call, my comfort by day and my song in the night, my hope, my salvation, my all. Where Dost thou do shepherd resort with thy sheep to feed them in pastures of love? Say why in the valley of death should I weep or alone in this wilderness road? Oh, why should I walk? Number 281. 281. I've seen the light. Oh, oh, oh. 
Songs based off of Hebrews 13, verse 5, among other verses. It says, uh, Let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's where that comes from. Number 162. 162. <laughs>
number 333. <laughs> May the mind of Christ my Savior Anybody need a reminder on the announcements? Um, street preaching this Saturday at 1 o'clock, regular time, place. It'll be the 20th. And men, you know who you are. We have a business meeting this Tuesday at 6. Okay. And it appears the bathrooms are out of order, so you might want to find an alternate source of elimination this afternoon. Matthew chapter 20 might be a problem with the building. I'm not sure because we have two of the bathrooms here out of order, so it might be a, uh, might be a, a building issue. We'll figure that out later. But the blue room's working. Uh, you're going to have a hard time stopping that up, so that's wide open. You take all your business out there, and it will, it will treat you well. All right. Matthew 20. Mm -hmm. Get Matthew 20 and hold Mark 10 in your other hand. Matthew 20 and Mark 10. Lord, thank you for the service this morning. Thank you for meeting with us. Lord, thank you for meeting with the uh, um, services at camp and uh, speakers there ministering to people's hearts and I think for the um, counselors and the time they put into that voluntarily and Lord ask that you please um, reward them for that Lord you said you would and um, it's even rewarding on this side seeing people be helped and Lord ask that you'd help us to stay faithful help us to take uh, what we learned and Lord I hope the teens to take what they learned this week to hide it in their heart and that they would be able to be able to counsel and minister to somebody else. Lord, I ask that you please help those uh, direction of their life to be changed and that they would appreciate it and they would go on and serve you and in the things they learned this week. Lord, I ask you bless this lesson now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Mark 10. And let's get... Um, Mark ten thirty five, and this is called a supposed contradiction in the Bible. I like to show these every once in a while, just to show you 
that the people who say the Bible is full of contradictions are educated beyond their intelligence. And you can write that down. You can say that to their face. Use your discernment and use compassion when you say that. And maybe there's a better approach. Certainly there's better approaches at different times. But somebody that takes issue with this book, I take issue with them. And how I respond to them directly um, varies depending on the circumstance and determining varies on their heart and their heart attitude. So here's a supposed contradiction, and I want to show you how this works. This is, this is very consistent in how the Bible presents a situation or a story or an event. <clears throat> Look at Mark 10, 35, and this is a parallel passage to Matthew 20. So Mark 10, 35, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. We all know who they are, disciples of Jesus. They're kind of the ringleaders, uh, Peter being the head of it, and then Peter, James, and John always showing up together. They got it in their heads somehow. You can figure this out really quickly how they got it in their heads when we turn to the next reference. They got it in their heads that they thought that they should ask Jesus to be first in the kingdom. Where did they get this idea? Well, they're like, well, we did a lot of stuff for you, Lord. We left our houses, family, and lives, and property, and all the things. And you did say, Jesus, ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and now we just, Lord, we got a, we got a request. Here it is, saying... Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. Where'd they get that from? They got that from Jesus' instructions, telling them to do that. So they did. They just did it with a wrong heart. Look at verse 37. They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. Jesus said unto them, You don't know what you're talking about, essentially. You know not what you ask. Can you drink the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I baptize with? Can you even go through the suffering that I'm going to go through to be able to sit in the position that I'm sitting in? And because they don't know what they're talking about, they say, verse 39, unto him, we can. <laughs> and you have a song about it in your songbook. We are able, said to the master, to get up and follow thee. And the sturdy dreamers answered to the death, we follow thee. That's in the songbook. The sturdy dreamers, here they are. Can you go through this? And they're like, oh, we can. Jesus is talking about the baptism of suffering and drinking the cup of sorrow in Gethsemane, being poured out, the wrath of God coming down on him with no way to get any help from anybody else. Don't you know I could have called 12,000 legions of angels? And I didn't because I couldn't because I didn't want to not go through the punishment that would pay for your sins. They said, come down off the cross and save yourself if you're the Christ. And Jesus said, because I'm the Christ, I cannot come off the cross and save myself, or I would not be able to save you. And he's asking the disciples. They have no idea that he's talking about these things, and neither would you if you were standing there. You would just get upset at the disciples like all the rest of them did for asking. We can. Jesus said unto them, 39, ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. They did have to go through sorrow and a martyr's death. We find out later in history. And with the baptism that I am baptized with, the baptism of suffering, with all shall ye be baptized completely. Verse 40, but to sit on my right hand on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given them for whom it is prepared. And the ten heard it, they were displeased, and the story goes on. Go to Mar Matthew chapter 20. Matthew 20. And look at verse 20. Matthew 20, 20, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on the right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I drink of? Who asked the question, James and John, or the mother of Zebedee's children? Let me say it's the mother. Oh, come on. You guys aren't very committed. There we go. How many of you say it's James and John? Hmm. How many of you think that the mother put James and John up to it? That's what the chosen thinks. It's a good, it's a good guess. You're on board with them. Uh, what wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on the right hand, the other on the left, in thy kingdom. What should you do when you find a contradiction in the Bible? There's, not a, there's a couple of right answers. Somebody shout out what you should do when you find a contradiction in the Bible. What's that? Study it. Study it. All right. 
Absolutely. Assume that you don't know as much as God knows. Amen. How hard is that? Yep. That's incredibly and possibly difficult for some people. Okay, assume you're wrong. What else? Ask somebody else. That's a great idea. Look up in a commentary or ask a preacher or somebody that, you know, one of your brainiac friends that, like, knows the, how the whole Bible memorized. Ask somebody else. Okay? Pray. There's the better answer. Who said that? Thank you, Jonathan. Praying is a good answer, even ahead of all those other things. The first thing I do is what Cody said. That's the first thing I do. Study, 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 study. And then halfway through that endeavor, I'm like, oh, here, here we go again. I know how this goes. I doubt God's words, and then I sh- get a hold of myself and kick myself around my desk, and then I say, oh, yeah, I didn't pray about this yet. And when I don't have it in my notes already because somebody else didn't already tell me the answer, then I have to do the old-fashioned thing and say, Lord, would you open my eyes to this thing that I'm blinded to? Okay, pray. That's a good idea. Any other thoughts or suggestions? When you find a contradiction, what should you do? Keep reading. Keep reading. Read the context. That's a, that's a huge help. So I prayed about it, and the Lord says, read them again. So I read them again. I read Mark. It's in Luke as well. That won't help you. And then it's in Matthew here. <clears throat> And I read it again, and one little two-letter word jumped off the page at me. Now, you've read it. We just all read it together. I'll bet this word didn't jump off the page to you, because some things have to be revealed to you by the Lord. You're like, well, was this revealed to me by the Lord? No, this is revealed to you by the Lord through me. But there's some things in your life that are going to have to be revealed to you by the Lord, because nobody else is going to be able to help you. Say, is that all this found in contradictions in the Bible? Every single last time. You know the easy route? The easy route is Matthew saw it one way, and Mark remembered it a different way, and Matthew had first hand, and Mark wasn't actually there. And he may have copied what Mark or John said later, because he wrote, that's the standard easy way out of, I'm smarter than God, so I'll just go with the modern scholarship position. Well, maybe all four of the Gospels are right. Who to thunk? You're like, oh, they can't be right because Luke uses different times when it talks about the crucifixion. Different times compared to what? Compared to when you think he should have been using the time? I believe Luke counts from 1 a.m. in the morning. 1 a.m. in the morning. He counts from 1 a.m. and continuing because he is referencing the time Jesus got arrested as his time clock. You know what the standard answer is? Matthew's using Jewish time and Luke's using Gentile time. Well, it's not anywhere in the Bible, but it sounds good. So everybody repeats it, and it doesn't match anyways. When you go to Gentile time and mark it for midnight, it's still off, and they're all off by an hour. So when does it count? If you don't think it's a contradiction, you just have more information because now you have Luke's one-hour offset time set that matches everything up, and you can put the chronology in order. But that's not this contradiction. Look at the one word in verse 22. Jesus answered and said, what's the next word? Who's he speaking to in Matthew chapter 20, verse 22 and 21? Nope. Who's Matthew, who's Jesus, sorry, speaking to in Matthew 20, verse 21, or verse 20, oh my, verse 20 and 21. Who's he speaking to? Read it again. You guys got to come to the same answer. Jonathan got it right again. Speaking to the mother, singular, one person, which in the Bible is referenced as what? The. What else? Sorry for the poor markerage. The. What else? Thou. Thy. Thine. What are these called in English, somebody? Not plural, but singular. singular what? Somebody said pronouns. And I believe these are called second person or third person? I. Thou. We. It's got to be second. Correct? Is this second person? I, thou, we. I, thou, we. Second or third?
Let's just leave that off. We'll just leave that off. I talk all the time. This is the important part here. That it is singular. What does he say in verse 22? Ye. Now the word you in English can be singular or plural. You're like, oh, that old King James Bible used old English words because it was written in the old English days. You're wrong on three counts. It does not use old English words because it was written in olden days to old English people. You're wrong on three counts. It was written in modern English that you're just, now you're not educated enough, right? <laughs> somebody's educated beyond their intelligence and then somebody's not educated enough. The reason that the King James used the old words and the old endings is so that they could distinguish, for one, this is among other reasons, so they could distinguish the you of who was being spoken to. Yep. Now it still uses you sometimes, but that has to be determined from the context. When the revised version was printed in 1881 and then the ASV in 1901, they put next to every you in their version, PL or S after every single use of the word you, because in Hebrew or Greek, it's, it's shown in the ending of the word, whether it's singular or plural. Do you know why they did that? Because everybody uses the King James for a standard, and in their day, they said, we want to be accurate like the King James is accurate, but we won't want to say the these, the thous, the yees, the you, the thy, and the thines. So what do you have? Well, you have you everywhere today in your Bibles, and it doesn't distinguish. Let me give you an example. Nicodemus, I say unto thee, singular. What's the next word? Ye must be born, Ye must be born again. You know what that gives me liberty to do? Preach it to anybody I want to. Because he said to an individual, plural, must be born again. Everybody must be born again. You know where that's lost? Every new version. Except for the revised version, because they have it in their little P, L, and S. Jesus is speaking to one person here. Who does he address in verse 22? He addresses more than one person in 22. You see that? Where is that answered? In a King James text that we just leave alone even when we don't know why we don't change all the words to make them easier to understand. Okay, I like that stuff. That's all there is to it. They're all standing there. They're all talking. And what's the order of events? The mother came up to Jesus and said, can my two, all the disciples are standing there, Jesus standing there, can I have my two sons like sit on your right hand and your left hand? And what's Jesus' response? I'm guessing probably nothing, right? He's probably standing there and be like, Seriously? Really? Letting everybody hear it, letting everybody see what's going on, and not responding at all. And then Jesus may have turned to James and John and done the, done the old shoulder shrug. Hey, do you guys have something to say? Did you want to add to this? Is this your idea or her idea? Are you on board with this? Uh, yeah, Jesus. Can you grant us that we sit on your... And now what happens? It's solidified that we weren't just, oh, yeah, we didn't mean that. No, no you thought about it for weeks. And you dwelt on this thought of where's my preeminence going to be in the kingdom, and it's on all of your hearts, and this is the thing Jesus is addressing in this whole passage. Back up to chapter 19. Chapter 19, this is going to lead into the vineyard parable in the beginning of chapter 20. Look at 19, verse 27. It's not just James and John. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And you're like, man, those disciples, they're kind of getting greedy, hanging out with Jesus, getting a little bit homesick, missing out on the old trades, the fishing and the fig picking or whatever Nathaniel's trade was, and following John the Baptist and his craziness. Like maybe they were getting a little bit wearied in well-doing, and they're going to Jesus with the things that are on their hearts for weeks and weeks and saying, Lord, is this really worth it? Because we're not getting any recognition. And we're starting to see more and more opposition. And nobody really likes what we're saying. And we don't even have all the answers because we have to keep coming back to you to get the answers. And Jesus tells them in so many words, it will be worth it all. Verse 28. You're going to have 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. You're going to have quite a place in this thing called the kingdom of heaven, verse 23, also overlapping the kingdom of God, verse 24. Now read verse 30. But many 
that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Peter and James and John, would you guys like to be last or would you like to be first? And they don't answer. They just keep asking the wrong questions. And then a parable later, they say, we want to be first. And Jesus says, let me remind you, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Now, do you want to be first or do you want to be last? It's not a trick question. Where do you want to be? Do you want to be first now and last later? Or would you rather be last now and first later? Let me tell you a story. For the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is a householder which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard, and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. And again he went about the sixth hour and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. It's not a very good excuse, because they weren't in the place where hiring is done. But for some reason, the householder accepts their excuse and says, That's okay. That's okay. Come work in my vineyard anyways. So I don't think that's an important part of the story, that they were all the day idle. Verse 7, they say unto him, No man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came, they were hired about the eleventh hour. They, uh, when they came, that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. Is that what he agreed to? Absolutely. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they received it, they murmured against the goodman of the house, saying, These have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. They said that they should have received more, but their murmuring said that the others should have received less. Something wrong with their heart. 13, but he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Does not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I'll give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. For many be called, but few chosen. Do you think he's trying to show them something about the first being last and the last being first? He's given it three times now, and he's going to give it again in verse 26. It shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him him be your servant. The way to be first in God's kingdom is to be last in this kingdom that you live in now. We have a few characters and a few items and a few locations in this parable that should be identified. Number one, we have the goodman in verse one. I'm sorry, the householder in verse one. And then he's also called the goodman in verse 11. I'm pretty sure that's Jesus Christ. That's not hard to determine. We have the laborers. The laborers show up in verse 2. They show up in verses 3 through 5. And they show up in verses 6 and 7. You have the first laborers that worked all day. I think that's one group of laborers. You have a middle group of laborers. You have laborers that worked somewhat less than a day. But then you have the last laborers who worked an hour or maybe less than an hour. And the way I figure that is he's going into the marketplace and gathering laborers at the 11th hour, correct? And he's paying them at sundown. I don't even know if those guys got a full 60 minutes of work in. And depending on the time of year when the days aren't even 12 hours long, but they're still divided into 12 equal lengths, it may have been less than a half hour of work that these guys actually put in in the vineyard. So you could see why people would be upset. But I think those are three different groups. The first group, full 12-hour day, middle groups, and then the last. 
In verse 8, you have a, um, a switch on the words. Look at verse 8. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith. Now, who's the Lord of the vineyard? You say, well, it's obviously the husbandman or the goodman. It may be. But what's that? I think it's the owner that owns the whole vineyard. A husbandman is one who keeps the vineyard. A goodman is the same thing. He's one who keeps the vineyard. But this is the Lord or the owner of the vineyard. When he was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto who? His steward. So now you have Jesus Christ. You have a steward. And the steward in the Bible uh, many times pictures the Holy Spirit. For one example, Genesis 24, verse 2, Abraham had a servant, and his servant had rule over all he had. And Abraham's servant in Genesis 24 is unnamed, and he's a type of the Holy Spirit who does a work that people don't usually notice. Do you know who is noticing your work that most people don't notice? The one who works and people don't notice him. That's the Holy Spirit. We have very few songs in our songbook about the Holy Spirit. We have a couple, maybe five or, or eight, and that's the way it should be. The Bible doesn't teach you to magnify and glorify the Holy Spirit. Amen. It teaches you that when the Holy Spirit moves in you, your desire, following His desire, will be to magnify Jesus Christ. So He doesn't bring a lot of glory to Himself, and He has one mention here, if this is the Holy Spirit, who gives out the reward. You have another mention here that should be identified. You have the marketplace. Look in verse 3. He went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And the marketplace is the world. It's full of people. It's full of noise. It's full of confusion. It's called the shambles in the Bible. It's full of curios in the third world countries. It's full of filth and um, oh, just a bunch of people trying to make a buck and a bunch of corruption. It's the marketplace and it's the world. You have a vineyard. That's the theme of this story, is the vineyard itself. It's mentioned five times in the passage. You say, what is the vineyard? The vineyard is the place that Jesus Christ calls you to. You could say it's your ministry. You say, well, I'm not a preacher, so now I can just tune that out. Beep, 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 beep. Newsflash, tune back in. You have a ministry. Yep. Quit thinking I only am the one that has a ministry around here. You have a ministry. Yep. And your ministry is in the vineyard that the Lord called you to. <laughs> the vineyard is your ministry. And one more thing we have here that's notable in this passage is we have a penny. And the penny is the thing that unlocks this whole thing. What does that penny represent? How many say that penny represents salvation? It's okay. I think it represents salvation. Only two committed. Three. We got three committed. I think it can represent salvation. How many of you think that penny represents a reward? It definitely represents a reward. So now it could be both, depending on how you teach this. But the penny is earned, is it not? Except by the last group. Is it earned by the last group? Nope. How much work did they do? Hardly <laughs> any, maybe, right? I mean, imagine the guy on the job site that never does anything, and he's only got half an hour to blow off. I mean, he can find some steps to hide under. I guarantee he will find a way to not do anything. Do you know why they got the penny? They got the penny for being there. Now, they're all called laborers, and they're all expected to labor, but everybody got the penny. You say, is the penny for rewards, or is the penny for eternal life and salvation? It just kind of depends how you want to preach it, and that's absolutely okay to do, to preach it either way. If you're not saved, you better get a hold of that penny, and it won't do you any good to do a bunch of works. You can do all the works you want all day long, and think that you're pleasing God and the Lord told you in the Old Testament and in the New Testament without faith it is impossible to please him you cannot have salvation without faith you say what about all those people keeping the commandments in the Old Testament they still had faith they still had grace just like you and whose faith was it we're going to do another poll how many think it was your faith how many think it was the Lord's faith? A lot of you didn't raise your hand. How many of you think it is the Lord's faith? How many think it is your faith? Don't you have to have faith? You know, in the Old Testament it says, the just shall live by... Nope. The just shall live by his faith. And the his is a reference to himself. You know what Paul said in the New Testament? 
I'm going to edit that. You say Paul's allowed to edit the Old Testament? He does it all the time. You know why he does it all the time? Because he takes something that applied to them and he applies it to you and he does it under inspiration of the Holy Spirit and God is the author of both and the author is at liberty to change his work in progress as it's being published and printed. You know, Paul said, the just shall live by faith. You say, whose faith is it? It's not hard to show you. Look at Ephesians 2. You all have the verse memorized, but I want you to see it with your own eyeballs. Whose faith is it in the New Testament? You say, what point are you trying to make here? All salvation is by faith. All salvation is by grace. Look at Ephesians 2. But whose grace is it? That's no question. Whose grace? Who has the grace for you to get saved? It's God's grace. There's, you don't have enough grace to do anything without God's grace. But you're expected to have faith. But whose faith gave you salvation? Look at Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that, what? Not of yourselves. What's the that? The most recent thing to the that is the faith. And that, that faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. What's the it? The faith. Now read it again. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that faith is not of yourselves. It, the faith, is the gift of God. Nine, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Lord said, Paul, I didn't say that in the Old Testament. I'm saying that today in the New Testament. That faith and that grace came from me, and it's from faith to faith, and we could go through the whole sermon on this. It comes through Jesus Christ, from the Father to Jesus Christ, the Son, and it's given to you through salvation. And the faith that you have is the faith of Jesus Christ that he has from God the Father, that God the Father will come through for him when he goes on the cross. And from faith to faith goes from God the Father to God the Son, from faith to faith from God the Son to God uh, to God's children, you and I, from faith to faith, from you teaching that faith to your children and to other people who receive the faith that goes back to God the Father all the way through. Faith to faith to faith to faith to faith. Faith travels all the way through. But where does it come from? It comes from God. Amen. And Paul says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved them. Why did Paul have to keep saying that? He had to say that because somebody worked 12 hours in the vineyard to earn a penny. You say, who worked 12 hours in the vineyard? Didn't Jesus establish a vineyard in the Old Testament and he told Moses about it? Didn't he tell Moses uh, they have a vine and their vine is a corrupt vine, a vine of Sodom, a vine of Egypt? Look at Deuteronomy 32. And you have a better vine. Look at Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32, look at verse 15. Deuteronomy 32, 15. But Jeshurun, that's another name for Israel. Cross reference is 33, 5. He was a king in Jeshurun, that's Moses. Jeshurun is Israel. Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. That's not good in the Bible. When you're kicking and showing how much strength you have. Thou art wax and fat. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. And you're like, oh boy. Fatness in the Old Testament is usually a good thing, but not when it's repeated three times. Uh, there's an ominous note to this fatness here. Then he forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed who? The rock of his salvation. The one who provided the salvation was lightly esteemed. Verse 18 Deuteronomy 32, 18. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. You say, how many times does faith show up in the Old Testament? The one I quoted a minute ago is Habakkuk 2, 4. Look at verse 20. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. That's the only other time faith shows up in the Old Testament. You say, what's the matter? A bunch of people who had trouble with faith. 
a bunch of people who saw God work and had to have very little faith to understand that it was God. All they had to do was have faith that what their parents told them was true. We crossed the Red Sea and got out of Egypt, and the water was over our heads, and we were looking at the fishes in the side of the thing, and we were on dry ground. And God swallowed up Pharaoh and his army, and history will tell of it in the future for millennia to come. That's all the faith they had to have. And these are children in whom is no faith. Verse 31. Verse 31. For their rock is not as our rock, even as our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Does that sound like the devil? So the devil has a vine, and God has a vineyard, and God desires for you to work in his vineyard. And if you'll work in God's vineyard, he has a treasure. Look in verse 34. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? The Lord has a reward for people who work in his vineyard, and the Lord desires to glorify his people but you do not get the reward today. You get the reward at the end of the day. Go back to Matthew 20. Who got in that vineyard real early in the morning, all about sunrise, about the beginning of the nation of Israel? A man named Abraham. He got into that vineyard and he got to work and Isaac got to work and Jacob got to work and they had their faults, but they worked in that vineyard and they worked there all day. And then their lineage continued in what was begun in Abraham's day, in Isaac's day, in Jacob's day, and those are the fathers that got in early, early, early. And many people tried to live after the fathers. Even in Jesus' day, they're saying, we are following our fathers, and our father Abraham didn't do this, and you're doing this. Our father Abraham, he did this, and you're not doing this. You know what they're claiming? They're claiming to be in the vineyard all day long when they're not, because they're trying to hold establishment of... We are like our fathers when they weren't like our fathers. Do you know who came along after the fathers of the nation of Israel? You could continue the lineage of fathers, but then you move into the time of the prophets. In the time of the prophets, they didn't come into the garden first thing right away. These prophets, they lived in Israel when the nation was going into apostasy. You say, what's going on with the vineyard? Ahab is buying out the vineyard from somebody else in there who says, I'm not going to give it to you, and he takes it anyways. Why didn't God get involved and keep Naboth alive? Because it would ruin the picture. Sorry, Naboth, you're going to be a part of this picture. What's the picture? My people are losing their vineyard. I have a vineyard for you to keep, and you haven't kept it. That's what the woman said in Song of Solomon. I have a vineyard, and my vineyard is mine, and they say she has not kept it. Why hasn't she kept it? Uh, because she kind of thought that the devil could take care of it for her for a while, and she was kind of undecided in between two different people, and then she decided at the end of the book that she's going to keep her vineyard, and Solomon's not going to take it, and she's going to pay Solomon so that she can have her vineyard. For those of you who remember that message. The vineyard continues all the way up until the time of the apostles. You say, no, you mean the church age. Who did Jesus say this parable to? He's telling it to Peter after he just said the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Do we have any reference in the Bible that calls the apostles last? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, 9, For I think that God hath set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death. He's speaking sarcastically, but the apostles are last in a long line of vineyard keepers, all the way from the church fathers, all the way up through... Uh, the prophets of the Old Testament all the way through the age of apostasy and then on into Jesus' day. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. And those disciples got tired of being a spectacle to the world. Jesus is about to get crucified. He's telling them that they're going to take me and crucify him and they're not receiving it and not believing it. And Jesus says, I have a story for you. There's some people that worked in the vineyard. And they worked all day, all day, all day. And they held on to the beliefs of the church fathers. And they held on to the spirituality of the prophets. But they had none of it themselves. And then there came some people at the end of the day. And they said, we want to work in the vineyard. Can we work? You want to come to work in my vineyard? It's a penny. You'll get paid a penny. Come on in. And they didn't even show up and do anything. They just showed up and followed a guy around. 
All they did, all they had time to do was walk from the market, follow the good men of the house to the place, and then, I don't know how many minutes later, a bell rings, and hey, it's time to get paid, line up, and they, well, I don't even know if they had time to push a wheelbarrow, and they turn around and walked back to in line to get paid. And then Jesus says this or in type. Look at what he says, verse, verse 8. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his stewards, call the laborers and give them their hire. Okay, it's the end of the day. Beginning from the last unto the first. Hey, you guys that haven't even gotten a wheelbarrow down one row of grapes yet, uh, come over here. You're first in line. <laughs> no, 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 just don't worry about it. I know you got like three weeds pulled, but that's okay. First in line, come on. Stand in line. No, leave your wheelbarrow. It'll be there tomorrow. Stand in line here. Line up. You guys that have been here in the heat of the day, back of the line. Go stand in the back of the line. <laughs> Do you imagine some people getting a little upset about this? Yeah. What is Jesus' intent here? It's the intent to reveal now, before the judgment, what is in your heart. You know what the Lord desires to work out of you, to wring out of you this week? That situation that you cannot handle to be in without his help. And he's going to put you in that situation, and you're going to say, I don't like this. You might even say it to God. I don't care for this one bit, God. Why am I here? Why am I thus? If it be so, if I'm saved, if everything is supposed to be good because I got saved and I'm living the Christian life and I'm trying to serve you now, and I wasn't at some other times in my life, why is it thus? And when you go to the Lord in that situation, you get an answer like Rachel got. And Rachel gets the answer, there's two nations in thy womb that cannot get along and will never get along. And you have two natures in your body. You have the body, you have the flesh, you have this carne outside of you that you can see and feel. And you're like, that's great. It's real. It exists. Yeah, but it's the only thing that, the only thing it wants to do is wrong. And then inside of you, the thing you can't see, and scientists won't even admit that exists because it's very unscientific, is a spiritual man that desires to do right. And you say, it'd be nice if I could see that. And the Lord's like, no, you don't get to see that. That's how I set it up, so that you can choose which one to serve and be thought a fool and be thought uh, the off-scouring of this world for trying to do something right spiritually. You say, what do I have to do to win the battle between the two natures? You have to go to the Lord and say, Lord, why is it this way? The Lord's trying to reveal something out of their heart. What does he reveal out of these men's hearts? Whew. It's not a bunch of good things. Just a couple little things they said showed their presumptuousness. Look at verse 10. But when the first came, they supposed, they supposed that they should have received more. Whenever in my head I have the thought, well, maybe this is true, I throw up a red flag. I've had to train my mind to do this. Maybe you should pay attention to this this week. When I think, okay, Lord, I'm trying to find something, an answer from you, maybe what to preach or how to answer this or how to solve this problem, uh, and, the, and I have a thought come to mind, well, maybe this is true. You know the Lord doesn't speak that way? The Lord doesn't say, well, maybe you ought to do this. When God speaks to me and when he speaks in this book, he says, this is what to do, do it. Oh, man, well, maybe you haven't experienced this. Let me help you. God doesn't speak in I don't knows, I hope so's, maybes, mights, and supposings. God is not presumptuous. You're presumptuous. They supposed something that was never said. They supposed they should have received more, which was never said. They were told, you will get a penny. That's what they agreed to. But in comparison to comparing ourselves among ourselves, we think we should receive more than somebody else because look at what we've done compared to what they've done. And the Lord says, it's funny, I don't see it that way. And I don't suppose. I went to that market and said, a penny good enough for you, a penny good enough for you, a penny good enough for you, one hour, three, six, nine, twelve hours. Penny good enough for you? Because a penny is a day of wages. And I'm going to pay some people a lot more than, than you think they're worth. But I think they're worth a penny. They weren't just presumptuous in supposing. They were discontent. Look at verse 11. When they had received it, they murmured against who? Against Jesus Christ. You say, I would never get mad at Jesus Christ. You would get mad at Jesus Christ. You would get mad at Jesus Christ of, over a supposed injustice that was delivered to you. You say, Lord, 
I did all this for you. You say, I would never say that. I know you would say it because Peter says for you what you won't say and admit out loud. What shall we have there for? Lord, are you going to make this worth it for all of us? Lord, are you going to really make this thing... Because because I know if I follow Proverbs, my life will turn out a little bit better. Except I'm not in the Old Testament. I don't have the promises of physical prosperity like Solomon did for righteousness sake. You say, well, it's supposed to work out better. Well, sometimes it does. Until it doesn't. And then when it doesn't, then whose fault is it? It can only be one person's fault, one being's fault. It can only be the Lord's fault. Because when you do righteous and then bad things happen to righteous people, there's only one person to blame. And if you truly were righteous, it's not your fault. It's, can we all agree with this? It's God's fault. When you do righteousness and it's genuinely righteous and you don't get rewarded for it, the Lord is the one that's responsible. And you say, I think I should, sometimes you say this in your head, I think I should get rewarded for doing right. And if I'm not going to get rewarded for doing right, what's the sense of continuing anyways? And now you've placed yourself in the discontented crowd who has worked a number of hours in a vineyard <coughs> for the Lord in a ministry that he gave you, but you haven't seen the rewards the way the Lord sees the rewards. <clears throat> they were presumptuous, they were discontented, and they were accusatory. They weren't just discontented and murmuring. <sighs> Look at verse 12, saying, these last, these last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us. <laughs> now they're accusing the Lord. Not just upset, not just discontent, not just murmuring. They're accusing the Lord because of an envy in their heart of their other brethren who are laboring in their ministries. Thou hast made them equal. How are they equal to me, seeing I've worked 12 times, or maybe half an hour, 24 times as much harder than them, including the heat of the day, maybe 48 times harder than them. And you made them equal to me. And here you and I sit at the end of the day. I mean, we're at the end of a different day, aren't we? I mean, this thing, if it applies to the nation of Israel and the apostles being last, it certainly applies to somebody who gets saved at 70 years old and dies at 75. It certainly applies there. And if it applies to the Old Testament Jewish people and if it applies to the days of your life, then certainly it applies to the years of recent history during this church age where the Lord says, I have a good vineyard. I got this cup, this, this wine, and I want you to drink this cup, this communion. I want you to drink that with me and remember me till I come back. And I'm not going to drink it until I come back and drink it new with you, Matthew 26. And I want you to remember that you're working in a vineyard by getting to enjoy the fruits of the vineyard until I come back and claim what's my own in my vineyard. It still applies. And you have a place in this vineyard among some presumptuous, discontented, accusatory, envious, and despising people. Right. You say, where are all these people at the market? No, they're not the market. They're the ones in the vineyard. They're despising with an, an evil eye. There's a Latin phrase that says, uh, translated into English, envy is indicated in the look of the eye. They looked on the other brethren and said, thou hast made them equal unto us, and they despised them. And in another commentator's words, they were ungenerous toward them. For what? Thinking that they worked harder than them. And the Lord says, I don't see it that way. In my vineyard, everybody has some, uh, some things in common. You were all asked to be here. You were all asked to be here by the same person. You were all called by Jesus Christ, and you were all agreed upon for the same thing. You get the same wages. And in your case, you get eternal life for free. That's the conditions. You know what else you have with this master of the vineyard? You have a friend in the one who is the master. Look at verse 13. He answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Do you know what they undervalued? 
They undervalued their friendship with the husbandmen of the vineyard. How did they get despising and accusatory and discontent and envious? It's the same way you do. Envy does not demand more for itself, but wishes that others should have less. See, so how do you get into that position when you're ungrateful for the things that the Lord has given you? You've been given a lot of valuable things. You've been given a place and a position in God's vineyard. You say, what am I doing in God's vineyard? I don't, I don't actually know what you're doing in God's vineyard. <clears throat> I know that in vineyards there's a lot of work to be done. We don't have time for all this, but uh, that, that um, husbandman, he picked the right climate for you. More than any other fruit, grapes require the right climate and the right amount of heat to produce well. Too many gardeners buy vines because they like the fruit in the market or because they know of a famous name. And what happens? No fruit because you didn't get in the right vineyard. In that vineyard, there's some pruning to do. That pruning is the most important part of managing a vineyard. It can prevent, quote, this is a quote from whatever. It can prevent or remedy many of the problems that arise in most all plants. Pruning is probably best viewed as the most effective means to head off trouble, improve your plant's performance, and keep them in excellent conditions. All grapes especially require heavy pruning to produce fruit. But after the first three growing seasons, different types of grapes desire different prunings. You say, what's going on? Well, you get saved. Or maybe you get a hold of the Lord and find out who the Lord is after you've been saved for a while. And the Lord says, you're ready to work in my vineyard? And you're like, Lord, I'm all in. I'm not ready just to work in the vineyard. I'm ready to be the vineyard. <laughs> I think in the New Testament, you are the vineyard, according to Jesus Christ anyways. Because you're the vine. You're, I'm the vine and you are the branches. And if you want to bear fruit, you've got to be a branch on the vine with him. You're not just working in the vineyard. You're working out the vineyard. You know what needs to happen in a vineyard? The pruning is one of the most important things, especially for the first three years. You say, why has it got to be that way? Because there's so much work to do on you. <laughs> you say, I don't like being pruned. Here's why you need to be pruned. Grapes need good air circulation because they are, quote, subject to disease in stagnant air. Grapes mildew, this is another place, grapes mildew badly and need good air circulation. You know why you need pruned? Because you stink. Because the wind can't get through you and blow off all that extra, uh, what do they call it, must, I think, on the grapes. And blow off all that extra uh, yeast and growth there that's necessary to use the grapes uh, in processing them, but is not necessary when you have too much of it. You know what you need besides pruning? You need some training. Training is the tying or propping of branches to guide the shape of the tree into a proper structure. This allows greater airflow, again, more exposure to sunlight, easier access to fruit, more productivity, and tends to a more aesthetically pleasing plant. You say, I want to be a good Christian. Okay, submit to the pruning and submit to the training. Training means propping it up against the wall or against some sticks and putting the branches in the right place where you can get to the fruit or shaping a tree if it has the, the structure that allows that. Oh, there's a bunch more on training. There's some stuff on grafting. Almost done here. If you feed grapes, while they are ripening, it can force excessive growth and spoil the plant. You say, I want to grow and I want to produce some good fruit for the Lord. What do I need? I need more fertilizer. I need more and more and more fertilizer. You know, you can over-fertilize a plant. And you can fertilize a plant at the wrong time and ruin the fruit that you already have. By what? Putting too much nitrogen on the grapes while they're ripening can cause excessive growth in the fruit where the sugar content doesn't increase but the water content does and the bunches grow too close together and they rot and they don't produce good fruit. You know what happens in the, in the vineyard? Sometimes the master comes along and says, you need some fertilizing. Sometimes the master comes along and says, you need some pruning. Sometimes the master comes along and says, I want to open this thing up and do some training on you. And you say, no, I don't want that. I don't like that. I like the way I am. And the Lord says, in order for you to grow properly, you have to grow under the master husbandman, and he knows what's best for you. Some people attempt to grow large fruit like the bunches sold in the grocery stores. You ever see natural grapes growing on a vine? They're these tiny little things. And you're like, when are they going to get like the regular size? They're not. Do you know why? 
because the fruit in the store has been artificially manipulated and then you think that you have to, if you're growing grapes, hold to that standard and that standard isn't even realistic. Those grapes in the store, for example, the Thompson, uh, hmm, Thompson grapes, I have it on another card. Those seedless grapes, oh there it is, Thompson seedless grapes that you buy at the store are sprayed with a plant growth hormone called gibberellic acid. This is used by a lot of other grapes besides Thompson when I looked it up. This increases the fruit size by increasing the cell size within each grape without adding flavor or sugar content to the grape. You know what the Lord says in the vineyard? Hey, you just grow how I grow you and be satisfied with that. And quit comparing yourself to all the other manufactured and manipulated things. If vines overproduce and have too many bunches, the grapes will never get sweet. This can be remedied in future years by more extreme pruning in the dormant season or by thinning the grape bunches to balance the leaf area with the grape berry load. You know what the Lord desires? He desires fruitfulness, but He doesn't desire artificial fruitfulness. See what happens in churches. You look around at other people and you say, man, that's a big, fat bunch of grapes there. I want to be like those grapes and look like them. And the Lord says, I don't want you to look like those grapes. I made you to look like you. I don't want you to try to imitate other grapes. I want you to be the grapes that I grew you to be. I don't want you to worry about how many bunches of grapes are on your vine when I put the right amount of pruning in to only have that many bunches of grapes. And you know what the Lord does? He comes and prunes things away. And sometimes people get discontented and they get envious and they get ungrateful to the one who put them in the vineyard to begin with. And the one that owns the vineyard says, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? By removing selected branches, the tree will bear more uniformly and will be easier to harvest. Clearly then, one of the main purposes in fruit tree pruning is to allow light and air into interior leaves and the fruit. When did these laborers go into the harvest? Go into the vineyard, I mean. I just gave you the answer. They likely went in at the harvest time. It's the time where the least amount of skill is required. It's the time when he can say, hey, pick the grapes this way and be careful. They don't have to know anything about anything about how to raise a vineyard or, or dig about and dung it. <clears throat> and these men went into the vineyard and require almost no training at all. And the Lord says, if you are happy to work in my vineyard, I'm happy to have you here. Now, what's your vineyard? You say, am I in the vineyard or am I the vineyard? Both. I know you're supposed to be working for the Lord. I know that you're going to get rewarded. I know that your work will be rewarded. <clears throat> you, get to the, you get to the spot where you're discontented and looking around at other things, and you're like, did I really measure up enough for the Lord? And the Lord is not holding you accountable to anybody else in this world. He's holding you accountable to his standard that he put on you. Amen. That's it. Amen. How do you have that? You have that from help from other people. But you have that by keeping your eyes on the one who calls you friend. You say, is Jesus my friend? Jesus was friends with everybody. He was a friend of sinners. He even called the guy that he spent three and a half years with who betrayed him the same day, friend. Yeah. Jesus is a better friend than you and I could ever be. Amen. If he's a friend of Judas, he's certainly your friend. Mm. And Jesus Christ desires to be a friend with you in the vineyard, and he will reward you, and it will be worth it all. Amen. Okay, that's the vineyard as best I understand it. Lord, I thank you for your book. I ask that you please... Help us to be willing to work in the vineyard. Help us to be willing to be a part of the vineyard if it includes the pruning and the training. Lord, uh, I don't like going through that stuff, and I like when it's calm and nothing changes, but if nothing's changing, we're not growing. Lord, I ask that you'd help us to be patient and see the timing of it and appreciate you and your decisions. Help us to agree with you, understand that you are a friend. And Lord, I ask you help us to... Um, it would help us to be able to see what's happening sometimes. If we're able to, Lord, I ask you to help us to understand it and appreciate it and be grateful. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Let's stand. Abby, have you got a song? Let's do number 332.